and welcome. Uh, it's last year's uh, last seminar for the year. This is our fifth seminar um, in the first year of uh, production, and we are planning another uh, session. We are going to continue this program next year, so we're planning another five uh, for next year. Um, we're very lucky to have um, Alan Broadfoot here with us tonight. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we um, currently reside, their elders past, present and emerging. Alan, welcome. Thank you for, for uh, this session. Alan is the Executive Director of Newcastle Institute of Energy and Resources. He's also the university lead for the Trace Trailblazer, which is the trailblazer for recycling and clean energy which is out of Newcastle and the University of New South Wales. Um, there's a focus on next-gen solar cells, clean energy storage, green fuel, and the circular economy. Alan, welcome. Thank you. i just um, share the screen. No, no, so I'll start. Um, I just give you the context of um, how I talk to this subject. Um, by the age of 28, I was actually a senior project engineer in a large mining company. Uh, and it's one of the greatest contribution to my development uh, or my career within manufacturing. That means I spent 15 and a half years understanding my client uh, and the market. And that's one of the most important things with the commercialization of product, which is stating the obvious, you can have the best product in the world, but if you don't link up to your market, you're not gonna achieve it. So my first role in manufacturing was actually teaching engine, design engineers how to design equipment from the market that I came from, which was, was part of the critical phase. From there, I progressed to, from, to chief engineer, to group, um, manager for mining to general manager um, of the, the group itself and then end managing director. My experience there was that we actually grew the company when I was managing director on average an increase of $1 million in turnover per week for seven years straight. That means we went from $28 million to $400 million turnover in that time. We went from four companies to 28 companies and eight of those companies were offshore. Um, that's what you call a life experience where look at the concept of startups, cold starts, acquisitions, change in management styles. It's a, it's a quick learning curve. So that from that context, I'm now talking from my last 12 years of my career working in a university environment. And part of the solution of going to the university is, was how do we improve our engagement with the industry and how do we be relevant to the um, commercialization pathways and accelerations? Um, the, the NEAR project, which is a, a model of engagement, Newcastle Institute for Energy and Resources, which I'll refer to NEAR, was based on, on the getting a best practice model for industry collaboration. And what we've achieved in that time is the university's moved from 5% of our research income as is with industry to, to this year, it will be moved to 50%. And this is what we've achieved in, um, in that 12 years of operation, which, which leveraged a different model. This used to be the uh, BHP Central Research Laboratories. The, the university campus is, is, is connected to this site but what you see in this is we've got workshops. Um, we've got, we have integrated welding bays. We have milling machines. We have our lathes in, in CNCs. We're actually building equipment at scale. Um, we also have integrated with that uh, 14 industrial uh, laboratories. So this is a dedicated research precinct for industry. And this was done based on I call my life experiences in leading the team to be able to achieve the objectives we, we, we've obtained. We started with four academics on the site. We now have 420, including 212 PhDs. That constitutes 18 centres working with industry. All the projects are based on commercial 
contracts and commercial outputs, and that's what we're leveraging off of. Now, with, like with any sector, we we you got to pick your sect your sectors that you can make a difference in and differentiate yourself. With the NEAR model, we picked energy, resources, food, and water. People see that as why that diverse group. The answer to that is simple. Energy, resources, and food are one of the three critical sectors of our nation, and it's all underpinned by water, whether it be drought or flood. Um, they are the biggest contributors for uh, gross domestic product, but they're also major employees in region. And what we did was we didn't go in and say we're doing research in energy or in resources or food and water. What we're doing is research in industrial innovation, productivity, efficiency, technology and utilisation, sustainability and security for those sectors. Now, I know this is about how do you, a topic more about how to grow businesses, but this is us applying a business model to research. What our sectors are looking for in an understanding of it is, is that the supply sector for those these these larger sectors, the um, the supply chains, are looking for industrial innovation. They're looking for technologies or competitive advantage that can help them differentiate their market from the imported product. We spend a lot of time with new materials, processes, and new technologies and services to be able to integrate into these expanding sectors. The biggest price signal at the moment. Uh, is coming from the cost of energy, not about emission reduction. There's a big driver for um, looking at proactive and efficiency. The outcome is emission reduction, but at the same time, it's adding to the bottom line. A lot of our research is how do we optimise the use of energy and water in in the uh, in the regional sectors for co-locations. Example, with critical minerals. Um, for them, this new factory out of mind for processing of critical minerals, it's it's important that we develop processes that can co-locate with agriculture and other infrastructure. Out in regional Australia, we have constraints on energy security, and we certainly are moving into a drought that will uh, probably restrict a lot of the economic development unless we can actually provide solutions in this area. Now, why I'm going through this is that what we've done as a university is moved our research programs to just simply be in the academic cycle to the industry cycle. And the first part of any industry cycle is where the research is. And what I'm going through here is where is the investment in the sectors uh, being put? And that's two of the areas. The third one is we're finding that in the sectors, there's a failure occurring. One, they're either a high failure where they're using the wrong technology in the application or using the right technology wrong. And what we're finding is we're doing a lot of translational research on how to integrate uh, these various technologies into the solutions that the sectors are looking for, whether that be agriculture, whether that be resources or the electric energy infrastructure market themselves. And this ranges from smart grids, how the application of batteries, how to integrate uh, solar with wind. Uh, this is a massive opportunity for um, uh, for a sec for the consultants and in, uh, in, in the industry engineering app, app industry companies to be able to apply their technologies. The fourth one is that seventy percent of the projects uh, I've seen the figures is that not going ahead for non technical reasons. So we can't go in purely with technical solutions. We're going in there looking at how do we balance the environmental, social, and economic output that is required. So you see this social research was now looking to apply to the use of transmission wires through farming land. We're looking at the issue of competition for water when it's becoming into a drought area. What we're looking at is how do we build regional resilience so that economic development contributes to social value. So what we're doing is a broad brush worth of, uh, of, of research across these particular sectors. The net output for the, for the last 12 months is we've now got 140 uh, university researchers engaged in the model. As I said before, we've, we've got, when I said 212, we've got 217 PhDs. 
Um, the big thing to note is 35% of our clients are repeat. We have five industrial workshops on the site and we've got three glass houses supporting our agricultural research. One thing we'd noticed in the sector prior to uh, COVID, the, the, the focus was on resources and critical minerals, even though it is the big topic at the moment. What we've seen in the last 12 months is we saw a massive swing to energy research. I think that was more of a case that energy research was constrained and the market was constrained mainly because of um, issues in policy within governments, issues uncertainty in the market, and certainly COVID-related. What we're seeing now is this massive swing. Normally, we would see one-third energy, our research, one-third resources, and the other third environment, food, and water. So it is more of a balanced model. At the moment, the inquiry rate is high, so the market is, is rapidly uh, expanding. That in the last six months, we've taken um, signed contracts for $60 million in new research contracts. Our current, um, you want to use the word order book for research at the moment, is $185 million. So it's not a small business um, in what we're doing, engaged with research with industry. How do people say to me, what's our research areas? What our staff done here is actually map a region. And these are the areas that we're specializing in, but they're all integrated. You know, where we're looking at food and water security, where we're looking at low carbon steel making or back to eco-efficient mineral processing, they are all common to region. They do have common supply chains. They do have common community. They do have common infrastructure. When you think about it, what research we do and specialize is regional research, not, not capital city. Um, so that's a collection of what, what we've been working on. Underpinned by this is not research in isolation. We're working with a variety of stakeholders to be part of the, the federal and state government initiatives in, in the marketplace. One is, as was um, John mentioned, is that we're successful with the University of New South Wales to secure one of the six trailblazer programs for, for the country. Ours is in recycling and clean energy. Those two things go together because we do have a technologies out there that are not recyclable. We're looking at the next generation of technologies and make, ensuring that they are recyclable in that process. That's a $204 million cash investment from industry, um, the government and the universities for a, for a four-year program. We also co-host with the University of New South Wales, the New South Wales Decarbonisation Innovation Hub. That's working with industry uh, and academics across the state to how do we leverage to together work collaboratively to access the funds from the New South Wales government in decarbonisation. Uh, to be more effective in our research and to create new commercialization pathways. We also host for the chief uh, scientist and engineer of New South Wales, the Energy Resources Knowledge Hub. What we find in the market, knowledge is the competitive advantage the industry um, appreciates the most. Knowing what where the market is shifting to, what are the new technologies evolving, what are the new projects, and understand the accessibility. This is a network of networks from uh, Business New South Wales to um, the Narrabri Industry uh, um, Network uh, to RDA, Arana, and back here to Hunter Net and, and uh, the Australian Industry Group of us sharing the information of what events are actually happening across the region. We also put in a bid with industry to secure a hydrogen technology cluster for the state of New South Wales is called New H2. Um, we originally put that bid in, was hosted at the university, it's now been hosted by HunterNet. And we also um, involved with establishment of a Hunter Hydrogen Task Force, which is a big um, development that's happening here in the Hunter. But I'm going to talk about Trailblazer. What we put into Trailblazer was some of those learnings that we had about how do we create accelerated pathways. What's happening is that there's an economic uh, shift in you know, by necessity with, with clean energy. 
And what we're looking at is how do we accelerate uh, new innovation into the sector to create new market segments. It's about fast-tracking commercialization for a, a national need. It's about strengthening our capabilities of both the university to be able to deliver that, but also our industry partners to support this um, translation. It's providing specialized infrastructure for the technology development that traditionally lags because the market gets ahead of what we've got to be able to support it. And we need to be looking at new critical skills. We can't afford to go back and do a four-year course, even though we do have an undergraduate course in renewable energy, but it is about short courses. It's about applied masters. It's it's about micro-credentials to allow an industry to be rel uh, the sector to be relevant to this new specialization of technologies that are evolving. The we're not starting at ground zero. There's already been a significant investment across the two universities into research for the energy sector. Um, it's is a hundred million dollars plus. So that two hundred four million is sitting on a hundred million dollars worth of infrastructure. So you can see NEARS in there. That was a $30 million educational infrastructure fund. The other one hosts the University of Newcastle is the Centre of Excellence for um, eco-efficient eco beneficiation of minerals, which is very much focused on critical minerals. Um, that's a $35 million uh, project. So you keep building that. We're not starting that ground zero. We're building on in collectively what is something that's already in play but focusing on the clean energy sector. What we're trying to do is we've got to remember in engineered products, it still takes 10 to 20 years to get to market. What we're trying to do is how do we do a decade's worth of change in four years? How do we accelerate new technologies to get that into the sector? At the same time, we're virtually creating new market segments. And then how do we upskill the sector to be able to support these new technologies. Um, very much focused in the bid on the hunter, because there was a saying that in the bid that we said, if we can't get the hunter right in the transition, how, what hope we got to be doing in the nation? So that, that we've got the, um, the multiple coal-fired power stations sitting here. We've got the high infrastructure. We've got a aluminium smelter, which is 12.5% of the load of the state. Um, we have large emerging industries from um, occurring in the region is how do we get that distributed energy generation um, in a sustainable model and contribute to the reduction. Now, again, we, we sometimes get confused with the, the concept of the startup from maybe from a software point of view. It's completely different in an industrial sphere. The value of death in the industry engineered products upscaling is that point when you have to commit to a lease, a seven-year lease is probably the minimum you can negotiate. It's the point where you've got to get that initial capital on speculative uh, research, which could be in the order of $10 million. If you get it wrong, where does it go to? It's funding that you can't borrow against, and you're not big enough at that point to get enough free cash to do leverage, uh, leverage debt. So it becomes how you get, you need to get through that phase quickly into, into market. And what we we're looking at a model is, is from those learnings, how can we integrate with that commercialization model to assist companies to get through that, that valley of death? And it's very much a focus on our infra shared infrastructure and co-location with industry. And that's the model that we try to provide. And what we're looking at here is a fully integrated uh, ecosystem where we're combining the research platform, which we used to sit in isolation at a university, with the commercialization uh, pathways of the industry partner. Essentially, we're bringing the industry commercialization partner back into the research uh, agenda early. And we're doing that by um, coexisting, but looking at the, the uh, upscaling of the equipment for demonstration to market while it's still in the research phase. What we, that means is we're upscaling the design from the bench top uh, or from the lab into a workshop where it's at 
at one fifth scale or bigger, be able to bring the client, the market there to demonstrate what a capability is. We're also de-risking the prototyping of the equipment in that workshop in advance of going to the field. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go along. Um, it's leveraging often the inputs from a very strong position, but bringing CSIRO together with the two universities, with our industry partners, and combining our existing uh, initiatives together becomes a very powerful platform to leverage off. And it's very much focused on deliverable in the complete supply chain. The, this is in this presentation, which become available, is we're showing some of the project areas that we're focused on. It's very much about lifting uh, markets, products that are sitting in TRL six to seven and getting it into the market. So we've got 33% of our projects already at TRL eight being pushed out to, to nine into the market in, in a short time, 48% are at six and seven. So we've got a very much high focus on commercial outputs. We hope to have our first products out, not in four years, but more closer to the three years uh, with, it, with the models that we've got. We're also not building a bridge to nowhere. We're trying to build in this bridge, uh, permanent bridge for our two universities where we can bring new projects through into the same supply chain. Um, again, I suppose the government funds is helping us to de-risk the establishment of that model where universities are also facing challenges in, in the current market. As John said, we're looking at the next generation of solar and systems. We're not looking at the old, the existing technologies. We're looking at the next generation of solutions. The wicked problem out there is how do we integrate all these new energy technologies? It's electrification, it's energy systems and storage. It's not limited to the electron. It's also about sustainable fuels and, and, and green chemicals. It's also very much of not giving up on recycling of existing technologies, but trying new platforms of how to recycle um, solar cells and, and uh, lithium batteries and how, how do we provide solutions for the past, but also how do we integrate upfront the circular economy uh, processes in our new technologies. Um, it is a collaboration with CSIRO. Example, uh, CSIRO is building an electrification innovation centre here in, in Newcastle in conjunction with this. This is for testing of inverters and converters and also a large area solar test facility. This is us working together as, as three institutions to be able to build up a, str a stronger capacity to support industry. Again, it's about the concept is what could if we could build a space that could address the issue of the challenges of commercialization? What if we could build a space where you can bring your equipment there and prototype and upscale your technology in our workshop and, and be able to demonstrate to the client how can what if you can test your prototyping here and de-risk it before you commit to a uh, a more substantial test site out in the field? What if you could co-locate with other manufacturers and other supply chains that they can build your, your product and help you build your product before you have to commit to the capital works? What if we could um, help uh, put seed funds in there for through innovation vouchers? What if we could actually um, develop um, the mobility scholarships that we can actually have our academics come and work with yourselves in the translation of the technology. What if we have a research training center that we can train uh, higher degree uh, staff in whether it be masters or PhD, which is your next generation of, of, of technology leaders. At the moment, we're graduating in the University of Newcastle model 60 PhDs per year, but 30 of them are going straight to industry as senior process engineers. And the better learning pathways is integrating that with the TAFE courses that, that have recently been announced and we integrate that as well. Now, what I've been talking about is a lot of words, but this is, this is the, our university. Uh, in there on the left, you've got a, a CO2 carbon capture unit. It's a, a multi-bed 
uh, fertilized bed for uh, for uh, chemical looping. Part of this project is 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 sitting at one fifth scale in our workshop, and a company is we've got four companies being formed in the Trailblazer team in conjunction with our research. This particular one is going to be established here in Newcastle, the company, but our first application will be in South Africa. Um, so not only are we looking at CO2 capture, but how do we convert it to a sustainable fuel, whether it be methanol or e chemistry, e e kerosene. The one on the right is an example where our clients developed a new technology of recovering gold from gold tailings. What we've done is we've brought it in, built the test rig in our workshop, um, and did the prototyping and actually the optimization of the model. They've now secured funding with the New South Wales government under the Critical Minerals Program to deliver that as a, a technology into the field. Again, um, bringing the industry partners into our workshop and you've got our, um, our chemical engineers doing the validation, our chemical engineers documenting the science but also providing the insight of how the optimization takes place. We then deploy that to the field and um, we will then embed our PhDs and our postdocs in there to help deliver the testing of it. And we've got a number of field trials that's happening. This is the translation of the model. This is about this particular case is they didn't have to rent a workshop. In this particular case, uh, we used our workforce to actually manufacture the test rigs for them. Um, we've also helped them leverage additional funds to, to de-risk the uh, field trial where the client doesn't have to actually uh, be exposed to, to the outcome, I mean, to the, the cost of actually building the prototyping. So we're, we're de-risking the process and looking at, again, accelerating that access to the, to the particular market. This is other shots, shots of the uh, facility. Um, down the bottom, we've got a conveyor belt sitting in a, an environmental chamber, and we're doing testing for uh, everywhere from um, Western Australia to Canada on the optimization of the belts. The upper left is is working on for Queensland for a um, coal seam gas um, water filtration of, of out of the bore. Um, down the bottom is the industrial printer used for winemaking, but we're making uh, printable solar from it. And again, I'm not going to push too far because I don't, I don't know every the details of every experiment, but you look at it, you look at the people in high vis, they're your PhD students. Um, they're working on the, the projects and going with them. These people have been trained in uh, safe uh, in safe operating procedures. These people have been trained in the industrial standards for safety. They are more importantly being trained in the technology and its translation and its application in the field. It's a different model. I must probably bring the, back to where I started at the beginning. How did we achieve that growth within the company that I worked in? There was three things I said as a two things I said as a managing director. My senior managers had to come to me each year with twenty percent of their budgets coming from had to come from new products and services every single year. That stopped us being just focusing on what we had. It kept driving the innovation agenda, giving new opportunities for growth. It allowed the J-curves of different technology to be uh, um, uh, in, in a link. The second one we said is 60% of the product has had to have 60% market share. Do not focus on mass production in this in this particular process we had to be nimble against the overseas competitor if we could find 60 percent market share that means we had a niche market there we could achieve higher margins the third element to that was do it quickly um most of the i used we used to have a plan that we could uh, leverage off our existing companies to help manufacture the prototyping and the technologies to get there so that we had to get to an optimal level without we were generating free cash. Once we generate free cash, then we could borrow leverage cash uh, into the business and to, um, to accelerate it. The fourth thing is, is that our competitive advantage was our people investing in training, investing in, in um, skills, 
was one of the biggest differentiator we had. We knew how to apply it. We had an engineered product. We knew how to apply it and provide solutions to the client. Focus on the solution, not your product. And that's how we were able to um, have that success. And in the near model and in the trailblazer model, we're trying to do the, the same thing and, and help industry to get through that, um, that danger period of where cash flow becomes its most um, intense, which is when you need to said, put in, get a seven year lease or put in for your initial capital equipment. I'm, I'm how, how, um, how reproducible is this model that you've established at um it's near i suppose it's 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 part of newcastle university you know you, you tapped into an existing infrastructure that um bhp had built uh and i just i just sort of wonder i mean i'd like this to be not just about universities but um so we'll, we'll try and put this into industry perspective in a minute but how, how applicable is your model to, you know, I, I don't see a group of eight universities being able to adapt to this model very easily. Not, And it's not just an infrastructure issue, it's also a cultural issue. Yeah, look, there's two learnings from it. I mean, I see some industries be very successful because rather than focusing on the infrastructure, they have to focus on the acceleration and that's where they have to collaborate. You can do the same thing with working with different uh, supply chain manufacturers to build your first prototypes and use their facilities. Um, you're leveraging that capability. You've got to avoid your capital commitment to your closer to your market, to closer to your first sale, so you offset that. What we've done here at this university is deliver it. It's not, um, you know, it just didn't happen overnight. Uh, it was a conscious decision, but we're a university that was born of industry we were we were born out of necessity a lot of our staff have come from industry so you're right but what we found is it got easier because the difference of it is is that we're able to support those 145 academics and those phd scholarships from the industry funds it's no different to industry taking the risk to employ people to get market share what the difference of it is that 145, most of them don't teach. They're working purely on research projects and they have to win the next research project to win it. And we've got third generation now of PhD graduates. So they've only ever worked for industry. So you do, in the first phase, it was about mentoring people to work with industry. Now they teach themselves. So it is, it can be done, but it's it's a long journey for a university to transform from the traditional model. And we've achieved that, but I still think the model is transferable. It's it's how do you manage that that, that critical fails as a scale uh, subscaling, which is a cash flow burden. And and and, and, and look, the subtext there is you don't have to convert the whole university. You you start small and you start in a focused area presumably yeah look i really liked um those pointers you gave at the end about um how you managed you know that well what ended up being 28 individual companies um that were under that umbrella um in, in your in your role in the industry i liked that 20 percent of the budget had had to come from new products and services i i i just hate the way um a lot of Australian manufacturers are, are just reproducing what they've been doing for decades um, with 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 some innovation. I'm not suggesting there's no innovation, but it, it's sort of um, minimal innovation. It's 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 incremental innovation rather than um, disruptive innovation. And and you're you sort of forced a, a um, forced people to stay on their toes. <laughs> well, if in the market, especially um, in in the the world market, um, in energy resources, which is where the areas where the companies worked, um, there's a lot of competition, and there's some global organisations that you can't meet their their you, you, you can't you haven't got the volume to compete. You got you got to have an integrated solution. So the aspect of that was. 
we could win a major contract. Say, example, we won a power factor correction uh, contract with the state of Victoria. Next year, the, our, our price of our capacitors that we're using went up by 30%. Um, you got be, so what we did is we didn't fight for that. We didn't drop our margin. That puts us into risk. What we did is we went and won a contract in South Australia. Um, but if you keep evolving it, I mean, we would develop new technologies, but we'd also build a second generation in the same time. So we released the first one. And then when time competition caught up, we were ready to release the second one. So you mate, if you maintain your competitive edge, you've got to get into that high net margins. The other way we did it too was we integrated production with technology with service and we got our net our net margin from our, our our gross. I'll go back one. We got our gross margin from the manufacturer. That, so we had lower margins there, but we got more gross. We had a higher gross margin on it. But we won that work because we're using our technology and we serviced it. And our technology was sold because we manufactured it and we serviced it. And we used our service because it was our technology and our manufacturing. But we wouldn't allow internal discounting. You didn't give the margin away. You could so that way, those the uh, actual technology and the service got the net margins. They made the, the 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 free cash, the gross paid for the corporate. So you had to be strategical in that particular direction as well. And also, a lot of our companies, what I call coal starts. I don't like the word startup. If you've got a good business model, you've you, we use the corporate as the banker. And you have a good um, support network. You're just looking for the next idea to accelerate it. But we, you had to be when as you grow. Sometimes it, to overcome that valley of death, it was the, if we were looking for a technology that needed to get a competitive advantage, we would actually go and buy that company with its existing cash flow and its existing business to get that key technology. Uh, to accelerate us quicker. We didn't want to be uh, champions by simply, we, we had the novel idea how to apply the technology. So example, we wanted some gas monitoring equipment for, for, a, for, the sec, for, a, for the mining sector. This company over there had the technology that you can use. We bought the company. We then picked up the gas monitoring for the Collins Class submarines. They had, they had the specialized workforce, the skills, best in the people. They had the technology to test it, support it. They had the cash flow to pay for the business. And then we paid for an R&D program out of the corporate to develop the new technology to integrate in our other, our, our other company. That's, that's thinking um, you know, laterally on how you can accelerate quicker. We got to market within two years with that new product. And that strategically secured our other product, which we had the high gross margins on. So did you ever acquire a company to acquire a workforce? We we acquired companies to get critical technologies to give us market advantage, but that translated to that technology was a result of that workforce. So yeah, true. We we bought a company, it was a competitor, not for the competitor's sector, but we bought it for critical transformers. Uh, that no one else built and we didn't have that capability and we took those people with that technology but then turned it into a transformer company. Um, again, about being nimble, um, there was a time that the supply of, say, a 10 MVA trans, uh, of transformers in the country, all the transformer manufacturing went offshore, the large-scale ones, and there was a five-year queue in Europe to get a transformer. So we needed transformers to build substations. So we said, well, let's go for, um, we, we then bought that company for other reasons to get this other transformer for underground. But we said, what's the most used transformer in a substation in Australia? It's 10 MBA. So what we did was we start, we picked one, one transformer size, 10 MBA, but we sold it in not five years. We said, we'll get to you in 12 months, but we charge it, uh, twice the price and don't forget with your, your company the companies you're selling to the biggest cost is failure of your equipment not the cost of your equipment 
So the cost of not having a spare transformer is catastrophic, especially in the mining sector. So you're willing to invest in the higher margin. You have to chase the margins, uh, not the volume. Well, I, I think it's true in a lot of sectors. You know, I, I, I've been talking to people who are, you know, trying to do proof of scale and um, they've got 18 to two month, two year um, waiting lists for certain equipment that they're after. Yeah. And it, it just, it really destroys an early, an early stage entity um, having to wait that long. One, one other thing you said when you were talking about your but what, two bullet points that turned into four um, was do it quickly. And I'd just like to stress that one. Um, I've got a number of entities that I'm talking to at the moment who think they're protected because they've got IP. You know, we've got patents and it's like, yeah, well, that's great, but you've got to get there, <laughs> you know, do it fast. Think about how to get there faster. Um, it gives you longer with your IP, but you you never know what's around the corner. Um, so for goodness sakes, yeah, just do it fast, guys. Um, well, a company, uh, we, we grew up from 28 million to where I left them, it was at 400 million, but it was uh, the net capital investment by the shareholders was $1,000. So we had to do it the hard way. Yeah. We had to do it. I learned very early in my career, free, uh, free cash is king. Yeah, you need. To, that's why you have to do it quick. If you get caught in that cycle of getting it to market, you're just accumulating debt. That you have to repay, and it's very hard to borrow against said lease on buildings and uh, prototyping plant that you may have to uh, junk at the end, as opposed to a, a capital investment that you could on sell. So, one of the things you said at the end also was focus on the solution, not the product. Yeah. Um, can you just elaborate on that? A lot of clients come to us that they complain that uh, a, a lot of clients are only interested in uh, and don't want to buy their product, but they've got a, they've got a solution for them. Um, but is it the real solution? That I actually say they're trying to solve the wrong problem. Example, a company came to us trying to solve um, leachates for a gold mine, but a gold mine is only in processing leachates if they get an EPA order. Um, it might work, but if there's no need, you're not going to get a sale. They refocused on, we we brought their technology into our workshops and we tried it on PFAS, which is the chemical everyone's looking at at RAF bases. It, they had a 98% recovery of, of PFAS. Now they've gone on and now have a technology that's now being commercialized worldwide because they went and solved a problem that actually had, an, had an, that was identified and there was a need to be satisfied. So you can't go into the market. I always go into the market and say, what's keeping you awake at night? Now, you might have the solution. But you don't put that first. You say, well, I can solve that by this. Um in the market, a lot of people think we're doing custom design in our manufacturing in the old job, but reality is we had standard designs that we we would, we would customize for them, but it was they were standard designs. You got it, and, and because some people come to me and say, "Well, this client's just worried about solving their problem." So that's great. I'll solve their problem, but I'll sell that problem to every other client that's similar to them because they must have similar problems. So that's that's your, that's your market knowledge. So can, can always, ask, what, what's the um is there any upside um for uh Newcastle in in its relationship with industry? Is it purely transactional? So um you know you need this research done, it's gonna cost this amount, uh you own the IP. Um, or is there some upside? Do you get any royalties or anything out of out of your your research? Uh, it's it's, a, it's an upside, but it's behind the scenes. So, example, we are still about research education. It's still about the PhD completions. It's still about a, a master's program. We're now looking at undergraduate research. We've got a vehicle that can make it more relevant to our internal client base, which is our, student, our students. It also helps us attract academics to why come to the University of Newcastle and increase that volume. Um, like example, and we 
the, the academics in this research uh, are highly published in the Clooney Ross Award for the Academy of Technology, Technology or Science Engineering. There's two people here have won them. Uh, we've won it twice through the academics here. So engineering uh, research excellence is not separate from working with industry. Not all excellence is achieved through a white coat in the lab. There's so much knowledge to be found in in, um, in the real ap applications of the world. But it's it for us in terms of in return, yes, I mean, we've lifted our research income at the university up to 50%, where ARC is becoming, Australian Research Council funding is becoming more competitive, if not diminishing. We've actually found a new supply, uh, new cash flow to be able to support that. We've, um, I think, about 85% of all royalties for the university come through the near model, but the model is not prescriptive, it's, it's relative. So, we have the uh, BHP Centre for Low Carbon Steelmaking here. There, we've got 24 people in in bed into that, uh, including the PhDs. That there is very much focused on industrial a partnership with partners of BHP. But over here, a client, um, and so the IP rights are much more about um, because they're fully inclusive. The IP model is. Is, is totally directed to improving the product, productivity or outputs of BHP. There's no royalties there. We're getting funding for that research. But over here, we've got projects we've been working on for 20 odd years. And someone comes in to commercialize it, they will be paying the royalty stream. Yeah, sure. Because they're not paying for the development, they're paying for a right to access the, uh, the, the royalty or the commercialization rights. So the model will vary depending on what it is. Sometimes we just do a $5,000 transactional contract just to do proof of concept for a client. Will their technology work? So it depends on, I always say, what is the background IP? And we have to value that background IP. Any improvement on the background IP reminds the rights of those people who own it. And then what's the project IP? And how much has been fully compensated by the client versus how much are we contributing through an academic that's not being charged to a client? Yeah, okay. And look, just to take a slightly different tack, um, can I ask, and this I suppose is a personal interest, um, where do you see the opportunity in the hydrogen supply chain? What 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 are the unsolved problems there that you see are, are real opportunities for uh, entrepreneurial people wanting to get into that industry? At, at the moment, again, we're market driven, so you can see where it shifts. Where the big market at the moment is utilisation of hydrogen. We have to create a market for it. The problem is not technology at the present. It's the case if I produce a thousand kilograms of hydrogen, where do I sell it? Okay. So we've just signed under Trailblazer $16 million worth of contracts on uh, ammonia uh, engines where the technology is how do we crack ammonia back into hydrogen for injection into an engine. Um, there's a big interest in uh, direct CO2 capture. How do we get the price down? Um, but blend that with, um, with hydrogen to be able to create the kerosene, aviation fuels. It's um, how do we, I mean, if I was to produce um, a kilogram of hydrogen, I'll charge you $10 for that production. But if I'm looking at solutions to other problems where hydrogen is a byproduct, and that's when you use ozone, hydrogen is a byproduct, that's going to atmosphere, I'll sell it to you for a dollar. Or how much are you willing to pay? So people are looking at ways of scavenging hydrogen, but they're all small scale, but how do we generate hydrogen as a byproduct as a supply line and how do we utilize it the big driver there is energy security how to tain, how do we maintain the integrity of it i mean there could be with the geopolitical there could be disruption to diesel supply with geopolitical or with, with, with a flood we could still have uh, interruptions in supply chains hydrogen is something we can produce in especially in the agricultural sector to be able to support it so Mass production of hydrogen is going to be determined by someone in, in, in Asia saying, I want hydrogen, and probably that we can't influence at this early stage. 
But if we can look at small scale use of hydrogen, develop up a domestic market, there's a great opportunity where the two drivers are that that any well the big one's energy security and the other one is is the price of energy. It's there's an optimization model. And when I say price of hydrogen, again, if I was looking at uh, acidification, uh, processing with acidification of, of uh, water. Um, how do I solve that? I would use ozone and I would use hydrogen as a byproduct to recover that. And that, that could be enough supply to be able to uh, work out how to integrate that into their application. Okay. Okay, look, I, I'm not getting... Um any online questions um i don't know there's we've got a q and a section open if anyone wants to ask any questions of alan um i'm um i uh, can you just talk a little bit more about building regional resilience did did you how, how did you go about identifying where the problems were in in, in your local region uh, was that something the government had already done or did you engage locally? How, how did you actually work that out? And then how does Newcastle University contribute directly to building regional resilience? If you go to our website, um, you'll see roadmaps. So what we do is the same way we did market, you do market in business, you do market research. So the focus there was we do... Uh, both vertical and horizontal consultation workshops with the sectors. So the the vertical one is going through the supply chain from those who's, who's manufacturing to the end user, and the horizontal is going to different regions, mapping the regions that we support. Um, so then what we do is the, the, the roadmap condenses into what is the, what is the market's uh needs what it what, what are the the big things that's driving that particular market what directions it's heading two what does the market look from us three what can we do what we're going to do we can support the market with and then four what are we actually going to develop and do so example apple canvas the uh the telephone market to say what do you want from telephones they all want expanded keypads the Apple solution was uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the 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 yeah, the the touch screen. So, so you still got to engage. What is the client's needs? Then work out what they're seeking, but then translate into a novel solution. So we do the same thing. So if you read those those roadmaps from that lens, that actually dictates what we prioritise in terms of engagement. So that then. Um, you get a conversion of those. We have energy resources, food and water, but you'll see there's a map there for um, Upper Hunter. You'll see there's a map there for the Central Coast. You have another map for the Pacific. And then what's that about is, is that how do we then convert that knowledge or those directions into research that will be relevant to that region? The second phase is, is that how do we create that knowledge into new skills relevant to that region. So you imagine if we're working in a Pacific island, we've worked out how to apply technology we're developing elsewhere, we've identified the needs, we then make it relevant to their solution with their particular infrastructure. We then work out from there what kind of skills do we, we just don't do the research and walk away within what courses we need to deliver. Once you've got knowledge and skills, you then got to um, convert that into enterprise. And the thing that endures most in a region, if you create jobs, if we're working with indigenous community, we give them a solution, we develop skills, how to support it, and we turn that, help them facilitate that into uh, a company that they've created their own market. And that's, that's what you call resilience. So when you do economic development, you don't do that in isolation. How do you work with industries? How do you work with local councils to ensure there's enduring solution? I mean, the biggest problem is if I put a, a battery and a, a, a microgrid and a solar farm out in the out at far west, who's going to fix it when it breaks down? Who gets there quickly? 
especially if you're doing a small regional community. Yeah. You need to, be able to equip that, but then they that's a solution for a region. And then you get that continuity. Listen, Alan, I've got a couple of questions that are coming in online. Um, one from Richard Macon. Uh, how do we expand the industrial demonstration capability to bridge the valley of death beyond beyond near the well, your institute? Well, that's well, that that becomes about collaboration between different institutes or virtual institutes. Um, yeah, right. I mean, the biggest challenge in near is I always say when you lead. You're not following, so you have to do it by first principles. We've learned. I think it's just about how do we, um, where, where we, well, I tell you the truth, what we're doing it. I mean, example, we're engaged with a number of universities in the Pacific and saying, how do we support them? How do we translate this large research infrastructure that we have here and not have to reinvent it in, in a smaller uh, country, but actually, how do we leverage that knowledge so we can apply to them and train there? I mean, I was just talking to the Solomon Islands, their local university. They've only got two lectures with two PhDs. But what if we can provide solutions to their new economic development, involve them in the research, and we upskill them? How do? What if we can develop a docker training center to support them? What if we can have give them access to our facilities to be able to build it for, for that particular region? Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's 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 an appetite for change within the sector, and whether or not the sector is willing to change is is yeah, it's a question I can't answer. Okay, well, let's try another question from an anonymous attendee. With all the near experience of fossil fuel-based feedstocks and processing, how applicable is this to working with the waste plastics challenge that we have? Yeah, I mean. It's applying a sector that had a lot of R and D that we'd hardly do any research for the coal sector anymore because it's 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 in a in a different phase of its its development. Um, yeah, so we're we're already doing work with. Let's go back one. We're back in that social research. So we've got a um, a living lab facility at a village in Samoa, where we're working with the community to deal with issues of microplastics. Um, the first phase of it is 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 a social um, research on how to get the community to capture that waste, and the second phase is how do we process that waste. Um, and we provided a cultural shift by looking at looking and improving the mangroves with that microplastics, and we're now turning it into working with research to turn it eco tourism, so they can actually generate return from it cash benefit from it um, we are uh, we've got people embedded in the Pacific working as technical advisors for the Pacific Islands as the new UN treaty for plastics um, we're contributing there on the other spectrum um, we've got research in um, back on the ground here in Newcastle we've got a new spin-off company looking at um, bio um, Packaging. We're now working with the wine industry to looking at alternative packaging to glass for wine bottles. A part of that research is what's people's the market's attitude in drinking out of something that's not glass, um, and what is that 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 material that packaging has to be sustainable, has to be recyclable. The actual processing of plastics is not our research agenda. Um, there's a lot of people doing that work, so we're not trying to duplicate that, but we're looking at more of the agricultural sector of how do, how do we have that sustainable packaging and how do we work with the community to provide solutions. So, and Look, I'll do one last quick one. How, how would you apply these ideas to build organic sovereign commercial capability in nano manufacturing without actually competing against nascent companies? Um, well, I mean, we, we've we've got two research groups in in nanomaterials. Um, one of them is with the AMP facility. Um, that's with organic electronics. Um, I mean, the answer there is still market driven. So their work is on plastic solar, and the idea is that when we've looked at the plastic solar, we've looked at 
uh, making it recyclable from the start, and then it's the development of the the uh, organic base to um, to be able to produce the product, which is nanomaterial suspended in the fluid. We're also looking at the biosensor technologies uh, with nanomaterials. We're also working with um, industry to apply nanomaterial to research um, in processing of solutions for CO2 capture um, and also applications uh, across the world in um, uh, in a number of overseas applications with um, um, working with processing of different chemicals, clean chemicals. Now, I can't answer the exact question about how that we don't compete because I'm I'm electrical engineer by nature. I can only repeat what they're doing. I don't know the details, to be fair. Okay, well, look, let's leave it there. Um, I'd like to thank you, Alan, for a, a wonderful presentation and some really great insights. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully see you next year. Um, we're all running running madly towards Christmas at the moment. Yeah, six weeks of university shutdown. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Thanks, um, we'll stay in touch. I don't know. Seriously. Thank you very much.